This is The Dark by Karen Joy Fowler. In the summer of 1954, Anna and Richard Becker disappeared from Yosemite National Park along with Paul Becker, their three-year-old son. The campsite was intact. Two paper plates were half, with half-eaten frankfurters remained on the picnic table, and a third frankfurter was in the trash. The rangers took several black and white photographs of the meal, which were blown up to 8 by 10 as part of the investigation, showed clearly the words, Love Bites, craved into the wooden picnic table many years ago. There appeared to be some fresh scratches as well. The expert witness at the trial attributed them, with no great assurance, to raccoon. Becker's car was still back into the campsite, green to Soto with a spare key under the right bumper and half a tank of gas. Inside the tent, two sleeping bags had been zipped together, marital style, laid on a large tarp. A smaller flannel bag was spread over an inflated pool raft. Toiletries included three toothbrushes, a pan of toothpaste, squeezed in the middle, ivory soap, three washcloths, and one towel. Newspapers discreetly made no mention of Anna's diaphragm, which remained powdered with talc inside its pick shell, or the fact that Paul apparently still took a bottle to bed with him. The nearest neighbor had seen nothing. He'd been in his hammock, he said, listening to the game. Of course, the reception in Yosemite was lousy. At home, he had a shortwave set. He said he once pulled in Dover, clear as a bell. He had to really concentrate to hear the game, he told the ranger. He could have dropped the bomb. I wouldn't have noticed. Anna Becker's mother, Edna, received a postcard postmarked a day earlier. Seen the fire fall, it said simply. Home Wednesday, love. Edna identified the bottle. Oh, yes, that's Paul's Bucky, she told the police. She dissolved into tears. He never goes anywhere without it, she said. In the spring of 1960, Mark Cooper and Manuel Rodriguez went on a fishing expedition in Yosemite. They set up a base camp and two alumni medals and went off to pursue steelhead. They were gone from camp approximately six hours, leaving their food and a six-pack of beer zipped inside their backpacks, zipped inside their tent. When they returned, both beer and food were gone. Canine footprints circled the tent, but a small and mysterious handprint remained on the tent flap. Raccoon, said the rangers who hadn't seen it. The tent packs were, were undamaged. Whatever had taken the food had worked the zippers. Has to be Raccoon. The last time Manuel had gone backpacking, he'd suspended his pack from a tree to protect it. A deer had stopped to investigate. When Manuel shouted to warn it off, the deer hooked the pack over its antlers in a panic, tearing the pack loose from the branch and carrying it away. Pack and antlers were so entangled, Manuel imagined the deer must have worn his provisions and clean shirts until antler shedding season. He reported that incident to the rangers, too. What could anyone do? He was reminded of it guiltily every time he read Thedwick the big headed Moose to his four-year-old son. Manuel and Mark arrived home three days early. Manuel's wife said she'd been expecting him. She emptied his pack. Where's the can opener? she asked. It's there somewhere, said Manuel. It's not, she said. Check the shirt pocket. It's not here. Manuel's wife held the pack upside down and shook it. Dead leaves fell out. How were you going to drink the beer, she asked. In August of 1962, Carolyn Crosby, a teenager from Palo Alto, accompanied her family on a forced march from two alumni meadows to Vogelsang. She carried 14 pounds in a pack with an aluminum frame. Her father said it was the lightest pack on the market. She should be able to carry one-third her weight, so 14 pounds was nothing. But her pack stabbed her continuously in one corn-sized spot just below her right shoulder, and it still hurt the next morning. Her boots left a blister on her right heel, and her pack straps had rubbed. Her father had brought her a mummy bag with no zipper so as to minimize its weight. It was stiflingly hot. She sweated all night. She missed an overnight at Ann Watson's house, where Ann showed them her sister's Mark Eden bus developer, and her sister retaliated by freezing all their bras behind the twin pops. She missed the Beverly Hillbillies. Carolyn's father had quit smoking just for the duration of the trip so as to spare himself the weight of cigarettes and made continual comments about nature, which were laudatory in content and increasingly abusive in tone. Carolyn's mother kept telling her to smile. In the morning, her father mixed half a cup of stream water into a packet of powdered eggs and cooked them over a Coleman stove. Damn fine breakfast, he told Carolyn intimidatingly as she stared in horror at her plate. Out here in God's own country, what else could you ask for? He turned to Carolyn's mother, who was still trying to get a pot of water to come to a boil. Where's the goddamn coffee, he asked. He went to the stream to brush his teeth with a toothbrush he'd sawed the handle from in order to save the weight. Her mother told her to please make a little effort to be cheerful and not spoil the trip for everyone. 
One week later, she was in Letterman Hospital in San Francisco. The diagnosis was septicemic plague, which is finally where I come into the story. My name is Keith Harmon, BA in history with a special emphasis on epidemics. I probably know as much as anyone about the plague of Athens, typhus, tarantism. It's an odder historical specialty than it ought to be. More battles have been decided by disease than by generals. And if you don't believe me, take a closer look at the Crusades, the fall of the Roman Empire, or Napoleon's Russian campaign. My MA is in public administration, Vietnam veteran too. But in 1962, I worked for the state of California as part of the plague monitoring team. When Letterman's reported a plague victim, Sacramento sent me down to talk to her. Carolyn had been moved to a private room. You're going to be fine, I told her. Of course she was. We still lose people to the pneumonic plague, but the slower form is easily cured. The only tricky part is making the diagnosis. I don't feel well. I don't like the food, she said. She pointed out Letterman's Tuesday menu. Hawaiian delight. You know what that is? Green jello with a canned pineapple ring on top. What's delightful about that? She was feverish and lethargic. Her hair lay limply about her head and she kept tangling it in her fingers as she talked. I'm missing a lot of school. Impossible to tell if the last was a complaint or a boast. She raised her bed to a sitting position and spent most of the rest of the interview looking out the window, making it clear that a view of the Letterman parking lot was more arresting than a conversation with an old man like me. She seemed younger than 15. Of course, everyone in the hospital, hospital bed feels young, helpless. We asked him to let me wash and set my hair. I pulled a chair over to the bed. I need to know if you've been anywhere unusual recently. We know about Yosemite. Anywhere else? Hiking out around the airport, for instance? The plague is endemic in the San Bruno Mountains by the San Francisco airport. That particular species of fleas don't bite humans, though, or so we'd always thought. It's kind of a romantic spot for some teenagers, isn't it? I've seen some withering adolescent stares in my time, but this one was practiced. I still remember it. I may be sick, it said, but at least I'm not an idiot. Out by the airport, she said. Oh, right. Real romantic. The radio playing, those 727s overhead. Give me a break. Let's talk about Yosemite then. She softened a little. In Palo Alto, we go to the water temple, she informed me. You know, I haven't been there either. My parents made me go to Yosemite. Now I've got bubonic plague. Her tone was one of satisfaction. I think it was the powdered eggs. They made me eat them. I've been sick ever since. Did you see any unusual wildlife there? Did you play with any squirrels? Oh, right, she said. I always play with squirrels. Birds sit on my fingers. She resumed the stare. My parents didn't tell you what I saw? No, I said. Figures. Carolyn combed her fingers through her hair. If I had a brush, I could at least rat it. We asked the doctors to bring me a brush. What, what did you see, Carolyn? Nothing, according to my parents. No big deal. She looked out at the parking lot. I saw a boy. She wouldn't look at me, but she finished her story. I heard about the mummy bag and the overnight party she missed. I heard about the eggs. Apparently, the altercation over breakfast had escalated, culminating in Carolyn's refusal to accompany her parents on a brisk hike to Ireland Lake. She stayed behind, lying on top of her sleeping bag and reading the part of Green Mansions where Abel eats a fine meal of anteater flesh. After the breakfast I had, my mouth was watering, she told me. Something made her look up suddenly from her book. She said it wasn't a sound. She said it was a silence. A naked boy dipped his hands into the stream and licked the water from his fingers. His fingernails curled toward his palms like claws. Hey, Carolyn said she told him. She could see his penis and everything. The boy gave her a quick look and then backed away into the trees. She went back to her book. She described him to her family when they returned. Real dirty, she said. Real hairy. You have a very superior attitude, her mother noted. It's going to get you in trouble someday. Fine, said Carolyn, feeling superior. Don't believe me. She made a vow never to tell her parents anything again. And I never will, she told me. Not if I have to eat powdered eggs until I die. And this comes from Procopius' account of the first pandemic, A.D. 541. To Bella Persico, Chapter 22. At this time, there started a plague. It appeared not in one part of the world only, not in one race of men only, and not in any particular season, but it spread over the entire earth and afflicted all without mercy of both sexes and of every age. It began in Egypt, at Pelusium, thence it spread to Alexandria and to the rest of Egypt, 
then went to Palestine, and from there over the whole world. In the second year, in the spring, reached Byzantium and began in the following manner. To many there appeared phantoms in human form. Those who were so encountered were struck by a blow from the phantom and so contracted the disease. Others locked themselves into their houses. Then the phantoms appeared to them in dreams, where they heard voices that told them that they had been selected for death. That's the only explanation I can give you for why Carolyn's story made me so uneasy, why I chose not to mention it to anyone. I thought she'd had a fever dream, but thinking this didn't settle me any. I talked to her parents briefly and then went to Sacramento to write my report. We have no way of calculating the deaths in the first pandemic. Gibbon says that during the three months, five to 10,000 people died daily in Constantinople. Many Eastern cities were completely abandoned. The second pandemic began in 1346. It was the darkest time the planet has known. A third of the world died. The Jews were blamed, and throughout Europe, pogroms occurred wherever sufficient health remained for the activity. When murdering Jews provided no alleviation, a committee of doctors at the University of Paris concluded the plague was the result of an unfortunate conjunction of Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. The third pandemic occurred in Europe during the 15th to 18th centuries. The fourth began in China in 1855, reached Hong Kong in 1894, where Alexander Yerson of the Institute Pasteur at last identified the responsible bacilli. By 1898, the disease had killed six million people in India. Dr. Paul-Louis Simone, who worked for the Institute Pasteur, but stationed in Bombay, finally identified fleas as the primary carriers. On June 2, 1898, I was overwhelmed, he wrote. I just unveiled a secret which had tormented man for so long. His discovery went unnoticed for another decade or so. On June 27, 1899, the disease came to San Francisco. The governor of California, acting as protection in protection of business interests, made it a felony to publicize the presence of the plague. People died instead of syphilitic septicemia. Because of this deception, 13 of the western states are still designated plague areas. The state team went into the high country in early October. Think of us as soldiers. One of the great mysteries of history is why the plague finally disappeared. The rats are still here, the fleas are still here, the disease is still here, it shows up in isolated cases like Carolyn's, only the epidemic is missing. We're in the middle of the fourth assault, the enemy is elusive, the war is unwinnable, we remain vigilant. The Vogelsong camp had already been closed for the winter, no snow yet but the days were chilly and the nights below freezing. If the plague was present it wasn't really going to be a problem until spring. We amused ourselves poking sticks into warm burrows looking for dead rodents. We set out some traps. Not many. You don't want to decrease the rodent population. Deprive the fleas of their natural hosts and they just look for replacements. They just bring the war home. We picked up a few bodies, but no positives. We could have dusted the place anyway as a precaution. Silent Spring came out in 1962, but I hadn't read it. I saw the coyote on the fourth day. She came out of a hole on the bank of Lewis Creek and stood for a minute with her nose in the air. She was graying with age around her muzzle, possibly a bit arthritic. She shook out one hind leg, she shook out the other. Then right as I watched, Carolyn's boy climbed out of the burrow after the coyote. I couldn't see the boy's face. There was too much hair in the way. But his body was hairless, and even though his movements were peculiar and inhuman, I never thought that he was anything but a boy. Twelve years old, or maybe thirteen, I thought, although small for thirteen. Wild as a wolf, obviously, raised by coyotes, maybe, but clearly human. Circumcised, if anyone is interested. I didn't move. I forgot about Procopius and stepped into the National Enquirer instead. Marilyn was in my den. Elvis was in my rinse cycle. It was my lucky day. I was amusing myself when I should have been awed. It was a stupid mistake. I wish now that I'd been someone different. The boy yawned and closed his eyes, then shook himself awake and followed the coyote along the creek and out of sight. I went back to camp. Next morning we surrounded the hole and netted them coming out. This is the moment it stopped being such a lark. This is an uncomfortable memory. The coyote was terrified. We let her go. The boy was terrified. We kept him. He scratched us and bit and snarled. He cut me. I thought it was one of his nails, but it turned out he was holding a can opener. He was covered with fleas, 50 or 60 of them visible at a time, which had jumped from him to us, and they all bit, too. It was like being attacked by a cloud. We sprayed the burrow and the boy and ourselves. We'd all been bitten by then. 
We took an immediate blood sample. The boy screamed and rolled his eyes all the way through it. The reading was negative. By the time we all calmed down, the boy really didn't like us. Clint and I, Clint and I tied him up and we took turns carrying him down to two alumni. His odor was somewhere between dog and boy and worse than both. We tried to clean him up in the showers at the ranger station. Clint and I both had to strip to do this, and God knows what he must have thought we were about. He reacted to the touch of water as if it burned. There was no way to shampoo his hair, no one with his strength to cut it. So we settled for washing his face and hands, put our clothes back on, gave him a sweater that he dropped by the drain, put him in the back seat of my rambler, and drove to Sacramento. He cried most of the way. We went around curves. He allowed his body to be flung unresisting from one side of the car to the other, occasionally knocking his head against the door handle with a loud, painful sound. I bought him a ham sandwich when we stopped for gas in Modesto, but he wouldn't eat it. He was a nice-looking kid, had a normal face, freckled with blue eyes, brown hair. If he'd had a haircut, you could have imagined him in some Sears catalog modeling raincoats. One of life's little ironies it was October 14. We rescue a wild boy from isolation and deprivation and winter in the mountains. We bring him civilization and human contact. We bring him straight into the Cuban Missile Crisis. Maybe that's why you don't remember reading about him in the paper. We turned him over to the state of California, which had other things on its mind. The state put him in Mercy Hospital and assigned maybe a hundred doctors to the case. I was sent back to Yosemite to, to continue looking for fleas. Next time I saw the boy, about a week had passed. He'd been cleaned up, of course, scoured of parasites inside and out, measured. He was just over four feet tall and weighed 75 pounds. His head was all but shaved so as not to interfere with the various neurological tests, which had turned out normal and were being redone. He'd been observed rocking in a seated position, left to right and back to front, mouth closed, chin up, eyes staring at nothing. Occasionally, he had small spasms, convulsive movements, which suggested abnormalities in the nervous system. His teeth needed extensive work. He was sleeping under his bed. He wouldn't touch his Hawaiian delight. He liked us even less than before. About this time, I had a brief conversation with a doctor whose name I don't, didn't notice. I was never able to find him again. Red-haired doctor with glasses, maybe 30, 32 years old. He's got some unusual musculature, this red-haired doctor told me. Quite singular, especially the development of his legs. He's shown us some really surprising capabilities. The boy started to howl, an unpleasant, inhuman sound that started in his throat, ended in yours. He was so unhappy, made me so unhappy to hear it. I never followed up on what the doctor had said. I felt peculiar about the boy, responsible for him. He had such a boyish face. I visited several times, and I took him little presents, Dodgers baseball cap, an illustrated Goldilocks of the Three Bears, with the words printed big. Pretty silly, I suppose. What would you have done? I drove to Fresno and asked Manuel Rodriguez if he could identify the can opener. Not with any assurance, he said. I talked personally to Sergeant Redburn, the man from Missing Persons. When he told me about the Beckers, I went to the State Library and read the newspaper articles for myself. Sergeant Redburn thought the boy might be just about the same age as Paul Becker. I thought so, too. I know the sergeant went to talk to Anna Becker's mother about it because he told me she was going to come and try to identify the boy. By now it's November. Suddenly I get a call sending me back to Yosemite. In Sacramento, they claim the team is reported a positive. When I arrived in Yosemite, the whole team denies it. Fleas are astounding creatures. They can be frozen for a year or more and then revive to full activity. But November in the mountains is a stupid time to be out looking for them. It's already snowed once, and it snows again, so that I can't get my team back out. We spend three weeks in the ranger station at Vogelsang, huddled around our camp stoves while the air drops supplies to us. And when I get back, a doctor I've never seen before, Dr. Frank Lee, tells me the boy, who was not Paul Becker, died suddenly of a seizure while he slept. I have to work hard to put away the sense that it was my fault. I should have left the boy where he belonged. And then I hear Sergeant Redburn has jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. Known gratum, anus rodentum, not worth a rat's ass. This was the unofficial motto of the tunnel rats. We're leaping ahead here. Now it's 1967, Vietnam. Does the name Kuchi mean anything to you? If not, why not? The district of Kuchi is the most bombed, shelled, gassed, strafed, defoliated, and destroyed piece of earth in the history of warfare. And beneath Kuchi runs the most complex part of a network of tunnels that connects Saigon all the way to the Cambodian border. 
I want you to imagine for a moment a battle fought entirely in the dark. Imagine that you are in a hole that is too hot and too small. You cannot stand up. You must move on your hands and knees by touch and hearing alone through a terrain you can't see toward an enemy you can't see. At any moment you might trip a mine, put your hand on a snake, put your face on a decaying corpse. You know people who have done all three of these things. At any moment the air you breathe might turn to gas. The tunnel becomes so small you can't get back out. You could fall into a well of water and drown. You could be buried alive. If you are lucky, you will put your knife into an enemy you may never see before he puts his knife into you. In Kuchi, the Vietnamese and the Americans created inch by inch, body part by body part, an entirely new type of warfare. Among the Vietnamese who survived are soldiers who lived in the tiny underground tunnels without surfacing for five solid years. Their eyesight was permanently damaged. They suffered constant malnutrition, felt lucky when they could eat spoiled rice and rats. Self-deprivation was their weapon. They used it to force the soldiers of the most technically advanced army in the world to face them with knives, one-on-one, -on -one, underground, in the dark. On the American side, the tunnel rats were all volunteers. You can't force a man to do what he cannot do. Most Americans hyperventilated, had attacks of claustrophobia, were too big. The tunnel rats could be no bigger than the Vietnamese or they wouldn't fit through the tunnels. Most of the tunnel rats were Hispanics and Puerto Ricans. They stopped wearing aftershave so the Viet Cong couldn't smell them. They stopped chewing gum, smoking and eating candy because it impaired their ability to sense the enemy. They had to develop the sonar of bats. They had, in their own words, to become animals. What they did in the tunnels, they said, was unnatural. In 1967, I was attached to the 521st Medical Detachment. I was an old man by Vietnamese standards, but then I hadn't come to fight in the Vietnam War. Remember that the fourth pandemic began in China. Just before he died, Chinese poet Shi Tonan wrote, A few days following the death of the rats, men pass away like falling walls. Between 1965 and 1970, 24,848 cases of the plague were reported in Vietnam. War is the perfect breeding ground for disease. They always go together. The trinity, war, disease, and cruelty. Disease was my war. I'd been sent to Vietnam to keep my war from interfering with everybody else's war. In March, we received by special courier a package containing three dead rats. The rats had been found, already dead but leashed, inside a tunnel in Hung province. Also found, but not sent to us, were a syringe, a file containing yellow fluid, and several cages. I did the test myself. One of the dead rats carried the plague. There's been speculation that the Viet Cong were trying to use plague rats as weapons. It's also possible they were merely testing the rats prior to eating them themselves. In the end, it makes little difference. The plague was there in the tunnels whether the Viet Cong used it or not. I set up a tent outside Coochie Town to give boosters to the tunnel rats. One of the men I inoculated was David Rivera. David had been into the tunnels so many times, he's a legend, his companions told me. Yes, yeah, said David. Right. Me and Victor. Victor Charlie, I said. I was just making conversation. I could see David, whatever his record in the tunnels, was afraid of the needle. He held out one stiff arm. I was trying to get him to relax. No, not hardly. Victor is the one. He took his shot, put his shirt back on, gave up his place to the next man in line. Victor can see in the dark, the next man told me. Victor Charlie, I asked again. No, the man said impatiently. You want to know about Victor, David said. Let me tell you about Victor. Victor's the one who comes when someone goes down and doesn't come back out. Victor could go faster on his hands and knees than most men can run, the other man said. I pressed cotton on his arm. After I withdrew the needle, he got up from the table. Third man sat down and took off his shirt. David still stood next to me. I go into this tunnel. I'm not too scared because I think it's cold. I'm not feeling anybody else there. I'm maybe a quarter of a mile in on my hands and knees when I can almost see a hole in front of me, blacker than anything else in the tunnel, which is all black, you know. So I go into the hole, feeling my way. I have this funny sense like I'm not moving into the hole. The hole is moving over to me. I put out my hands and the ground moves under them. Shit, said the third man. I didn't know if it was David's story or the shot. Fourth man sat down. I risk a light, and the whole tunnel is covered with spiders, covered like wallpaper, only worse, two or three bodies thick, David said. 
I'm sitting on them, and the spiders are already inside my pants and inside my shirt and covering my arms. And it's fucking Vietnam, you know. I don't even know if they're poisonous or not. Don't care, really, because I'm going to die just from having them on me. I can feel them moving toward my face. So I start to scream. Then this little guy comes and pulls me back out of ways. Then he sits for maybe half an hour, calm as can be, picking spiders off me. When I decide to live, after all, I go back out. I tell everybody, that was Victor, they say. Had to be Victor. I know a guy say Vic, says Victor pulled him from a hole, the fourth soldier says. He falls through a false floor down maybe 12 straight feet into this tiny little trap with straight walls all around and no way up. And Victor comes down after him, jumps back out, holding the guy in his arms, 12 feet. The guy swears it. Tiny little guy, said David. Even for a VC, this guy be tiny. He just looks tiny, the second soldier said. I know a guy saw a Victor buried under more than a ton of dirt. Victor just digs his way out again. No broken bones, no nothing. Inexcusably slow, and I've been told twice, I just figured out that Victor wasn't short for VC. I'd better inoculate this Victor, I said. You think you could send him in? The men stare at me. You don't get it, do you, said David. Victor don't report, the fourth man says. No CO, says the third man. No unit. He's got the uniform, the second man tells me, so we don't know if he's special forces of some sort or if he's AWOL down in the tunnels. Victor lives in the tunnels, said David. Nobody up top has ever seen him. I tried to talk to one of the doctors about it. Tunnel vision, he told me. We get a lot of that. Forget it. In May, we get a report of more rats, some leashed, some in cages, in a tunnel near Unknown Tay Village in the Hobo Woods. But no one wanted to go in and get them because their, these rats were alive. Somebody got the idea this was my job. Somebody else agreed. They would clear the tunnel of VC first, they promised me. So I volunteered. Let me tell you about rats. Maybe they're not responsible for the plague, but they're still destructive to every kind of life form and beneficial to none. They can eat anything that lets them. They breed during all seasons. They kill their own kind. They can do it singly. They can also organize and attack in hordes. The brown rat is currently embroiled in a war of extinction against the black rat. Most animals behave better than that. I'm not afraid of rats. I read somewhere that about the turn of the century, a man in western Illinois heard a rustling in his fields one night. He got out of bed and went to the back door. Behind his house, he saw a great mass of rats that stretched all the way to the horizon. I suppose this would have frightened me, all those naked tails in the moonlight. I thought I could handle a few rats in cages, no problem. It wasn't hard to locate them. I was on my hands and knees, but using a flashlight. I thought there might be some loose rats, too, that I ought to look at light, at least. I also heard that there was an abandoned VC hospital in the tunnel that I was curious about. So I left the cages and poked around in the tunnels a bit. When I'd had enough, I started back to get the rats, and I hit a water trap. There hadn't been a water trap before, so I knew I must have taken a wrong turn. I went back a bit, took another turn, and then another, and hit the water trap again. But now I was starting to panic. Couldn't find anything I'd ever seen before except the damn water. I went back again, farther without turning, took a turn, hit the trap. I must have tried seven, eight times. I no longer thought the tunnel was cold. I thought the VC had closed the door on my original route so that I wouldn't find it again. I thought they were watching every move I made. Pretty easy with me waving my flashlight about. I switched it off. I could hear them in the dark, their eyelids closing and opening, their hands tightening on their net knives. I was sweating head to toe like I was ill, like I had the mysterious English sweating sickness. And I knew that to get back to the entrance, I had to go into the water. I sat and thought that through. When I finished, I wasn't the same man I'd been when I began the thought. It would have been bad to have to crawl back through the tunnels with no light. To go into the water with no light, not knowing how much water there was, not knowing if one lung full of air would be enough, or if there were underwater turns so you might get lost before you found air again, was something you'd, you'd have to be crazy to do. I had to do it, so I had to be crazy first. It wasn't as hard as you might think. It took me only a minute. I filled my lungs as full as I could, emptied them once, filled them again and dove in. Someone grabbed me by the ankle and hauled me back out. It frightened me so much I swallowed water, so I came up coughing and kicking. The hand released me at once, and I lay there for a bit, dripping water and still sweating too, feeling the part of the tunnel that was directly below my body turned to mud, while I tried to convince myself that no one was touching me. And I was crazy enough to turn my light on. Far down the tunnel, just within range of the light, 
knelt a little kid dressed in the uniform of the rats. I tried to get closer to him. He moved away, just the same amount I had moved, always just in the light. I followed him down one tunnel, round a turn, down another. Outside, the sun rose and set. We crawled for days. My right knee began to bleed. Talk to me, I asked him. He didn't. Finally, he stood up ahead of me. I could see the rat cages, and I knew where the entrance was behind him. And then he was gone. I tried to follow with my flashlight, but he jumped or something. He was just gone. Victor, Rat Six told me when I finally came out. Goddamn Victor. Maybe so. If Victor was the same little boy I put a net over in the high country in Yosemite. When I came out, they told me less than three hours had passed. I didn't believe them. I told them about Victor. Most of them didn't believe me. Nobody outside the tunnels believed in Victor. We just sent home one of the rats, the doctor told me. He emptied his whole gun into a tunnel. Claimed there were VC all around him, but he got them. He shot every one. Only when we went down to clean it up, there were no bodies. All his bullets were found in the walls. Tunnel vision. Everyone sees things. It's the dark. Your eyes no longer impose any limit on the things you can see. I didn't listen. I made demands right up the chain of command for records, recruitment, AWOLs, and special projects. I wanted to talk to everyone who'd ever seen Victor. I wrote Clint to see what he remembered of the drive back from Yosemite. I wrote a thousand letters to Mercy Hospital, telling them I'd uncovered their little game. I demanded to speak with the red-haired doctor with glasses whose name I never knew. I wrote the Curry Company and suggested they, they conduct a private investigation into the supposed suicide of Sergeant Redburn. I asked the CIA what they had done with Paul's parents. That part was paranoid. I was so unstrung, I thought they had killed his parents and given him to the coyote to raise him up for the tunnel wars. When I calmed down, I knew the CIA would never be so far-sighted. I knew they'd just gotten lucky. I don't know what happened to the parents. Still don't. There were so many crazy people in Vietnam, it could take them a long time to notice a new one. But I made a lot of noise. A team of three doctors talked to me for a total of seven hours. Then they said I was suffering from delayed guilt over the death of my little dog boy, and it surfaced, along with every other weak link in my personality, in the stress and darkness of the tunnels. They sent me home. I missed the moon landing, because I was having a nice little time in a hospital of my own. When I was finally and truly released, I went looking for Carolyn Crosby. The Crosby still lived in Palo Alto, but Carolyn did not. She'd started college at Berkeley, but then she dropped out. Her parents hadn't seen her for several months. Her mother took me through their beautiful house and showed me Carolyn's old room. She had a canopy bed in her own bathroom. There was a mirror with old pictures of some boy on it, a throw rug with roses. There was a lot of pink. We drive through the hate every weekend, Carolyn's mother said, just looking. She was pale and controlled. If you should see her, would you tell her to call? I would not. I made one attempt to return one little boy to his family and look what happened. Either Sergeant Redburn jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge in the middle of his investigation, or he didn't. Either Paul Becker died in Mercy Hospital, or he was picked up by the military to be their special weapon in a special war. I've thought about it now for a couple decades. I've decided that, at least for Paul, once he'd escaped from the military, things didn't work out so badly. He must have felt more at home in the tunnels under Kuchi than he had under the bed in Mercy Hospital. There's a darkness inside us all that is animal. Against some things untreated or untreatable disease, for example, or old age. The darkness is all, there, uh, is all there that we are. Either we are strong enough animals or we are not. Such things put everything that is not animal away from us. As animals, we have a physical value, but in moral terms, we are neither good nor bad. Morality begins on the way back from the darkness. The first two plagues were largely believed to be a punishment for man's sinfulness. So many died, wrote Agnello de Tura the Fat, who buried all five of his own children himself, that all believed it was the end of the world. This being the case, you'd imagine the cessation of the plague must have been accompanied by outbreaks of charity and godliness. The truth was just the opposite. In 1349, in Erfurt, Germany, of the 3,000 Jewish residents there, not one survived. This is a single instance of a barbarism so marked and so pervasive it can be understood only as a form of mass insanity. Here's what Procopius said, and after the plague had ceased, there was, there, there was as much depravity and general licentiousness. It seemed as though the disease had left only the most wicked. When men are turned into animals, it's hard for them to find their way back to themselves. When children are turned into animals, there's no self to find. 
There's never been a feral child who found his way out of the dark. Maybe there's never been a feral child who wanted to. You don't believe I saw Paul in the tunnels at all. You think I'm crazy, or charitably that I was crazy then, just for a little while. Maybe you think the CIA would never have killed a policeman or tried to use a little child in a black war, even though the CIA has done everything else you've ever been told or, and refused to believe. That's okay. I like your version just fine. Because if I made him up, and all the tunnel rats who ever saw him made him up, then he belongs to us. He marks us. Our vision. Our Procopian phantom in the tunnels. Victor to take care of us in the dark. Carolyn came home without me. I read her wedding announcement in the paper more than 20 years ago. She married a Stanford chemist. There's a picture of her in her parents' backyard with gardenias in her hair. She was 25 years old. She looked happy. I never did go talk to her. So here's a story for you, Carolyn. A small German town was much plagued by rats who ate the crops and the chickens, the ducks, the cloth, and the seeds. Finally, the citizens called in an exterminator. He was the best. He trapped and poisoned the rats. Within a month, he had deprived the fleas of most of their hosts. The fleas then bit the children of the town instead. Hundreds of children were taken with a strange dancing and raving disease. Their parents tried to control them, tried to keep them safe in their beds, but the moment their mother's backs were turned, the children ran into the streets and danced. The town was Erfurt. The year was 1237. Most of the children danced themselves to death, but not all. A few of them recovered and lived to be grown-ups. They married and worked and had their own children. They lived reasonable and productive lives. The only thing is that they still twitch sometimes, just now and then. They can't help it. Stop me, Carolyn, if you've heard this story before.